Because remember, the computers are now doing self-improvement. They're learning how to plan, and they don't have to listen to us anymore. People do not understand what happens when you have intelligence at this level, which is largely free. So that was the former Google CEO, Dr. Eric Schmidt, at the Special Competitive Studies Project, having a conversation with Jean Messerve about the future of AI and biotechnology. And honestly, it's a really insightful conversation. Let's actively dive into exactly what he says, because the implications are profound. Because remember, the computers are now doing self-improvement. They're learning how to plan, and they don't have to listen to us anymore. We call that superintelligence or ASI, artificial superintelligence. And this is the theory that there will be computers that are smarter than the sum of humans. The San Francisco consensus is this occurs within six years, just based on scaling. Now, in order to pull this off, you have to have an enormous amount of power. I was here yesterday testifying about this, you know, and we need like, I can talk at some length about how many gigawatts and how many nuclear power plants and all the kind of stuff we can talk about separately. This path is not understood in our society. There's no language for what happens with the arrival of this. I wrote a book on this with Henry Kissinger called Genesis, which you know I recommend, obviously, because um, I wrote <laughs> available it. Uh, <laughs> available on it. Available <laughs> in your usual places. Um, but the important point is, this is happening faster than our human, that our, our society, our democracy, our laws will address. And there's lots of implications. That's why it's underhyped. People do not understand what happens when you have intelligence at this level, which is largely free. So we believe, as an industry, that in the next one year, the vast majority of programmers will be replaced by AI programmers. We also believe that within one year, you will have graduate level mathematicians that are at the tippy top of graduate math programs. There's lots of reasons to think this is gonna happen. This is the consensus. You go, okay, well that's pretty interesting. Now, I can't do that kind of math. Very few people can do that math. How can the computer do that math better than anybody else? To some degree, it's because math has a simpler language than human language. So the way these algorithms actually work is they're doing essentially word prediction. So you take, you take a pe uh, sentence, you take a word out, and then it learns how to put the correct word back in. This is called the loss function. And it's optimized to do that at a scale that's in, in, unimaginable to us as humans. So you do the same thing for math. But there you use a conjecture and then a proof format through a protocol called lean. In programming, it's pretty simple. You just keep writing code until you pass the programming test. So strangely, the first question I always ask programmers is what language do you program in? And the correct answer is it doesn't matter because you're trying to design for an outcome. You don't care what code is generated by the computer. This is a whole new world. So yes, a whole new world. And it's not just Eric Schmidt saying this. Take a look at what Dario Amode said recently in a panel interview about this. But now getting to kind of the job side of this, um, I, I, I do have a fair amount of concern about this. Um, on one hand, I think comparative advantage is a very powerful tool. If I look at coding, programming, which is one area where AI is making the most progress, um, what we are finding is we are not far from a world, I think we'll be there in three to six months, where AI is writing 90% of the code. And then in 12 months, we may be in a world where AI is writing essentially all of the code. Now, here's where we get into something even more interesting. So basically, Eric Schmidt talks about the fact that AI is now writing all of the code. But what happens after that in year two? Take a look. So that's one year, okay? What happens in two years? Well, I've just told you about reasoning, and I've told you about programming, and I've told you about math. Programming plus math are the basis of sort of our whole digital world. So the evidence and the claims from the research groups in OpenAI and, and Anthropic and so forth is that they're now somewhere around 10 or 20% of the code that they're developing in their research programs is being generated by the computer. That's called recursive self-improvement is the technical term. So what happens when this thing starts to scale? Well, a lot. One way to say this is that within three to five years, we'll have what is called general intelligence, AGI, which can be defined as a system that is as smart as the smartest mathematician, physicist, 
you know, an artist, writer, thinker, politician, maybe not on the same level, um, but you get the idea. Uh, just the creative industries and so forth, but imagine that in one computer. Okay, well, that's pretty interesting. I call this, by the way, the San Francisco consensus because everyone who believes this is in San Francisco. <laughs> it may be the water. What happens when every single one of us has the equivalent of the smartest human on every problem in our pocket? So it means you have the best architect when you have an architecture problem. Another thing that's going on is the development of agentic solutions. And agents are referred to systems that have input and output in memory, and they learn. An example here is that I want to uh, buy another house. Uh, I happen to like Virginia. I grew up in Virginia. I say, find me a house in the greater McLean area. Look at the, that's one agent. Look at all the rules, figure out how big a house I can build. That's another agent. Do the transaction to buy the land. That's another agent. Design the house with a human architect, right? But sort of ignore them for most of the thing, but they have to sign it off. And then I approve it and then find the contractor, right? Hire the contractor, pay the bills, and then at the end, sue the contractor for lack of performance. <laughs> okay? Now, I just gave you the stupidest possible explanation. I just described every business process, every government process, and every, and every sort of academic process in our nation. So it isn't just the programmers that are going to be out of work. We're all going to be out of work. No, that's not a consequence. I'll come to that. But, but the reason I want, to, I want to make the point here is that in the next year or two, this foundation is being locked in, and it's not, we're not going to stop it. And in this part, Eric Schmidt talks about the jobs that AI is going to replace. And by the way, on the jobs thing, everyone assumes that automation will, will eliminate jobs. If you look at the history of automation ever since the, uh, the looms and, uh, in uh, 300 years ago, the jobs are changed, but more jobs are created than destroyed. In this case, you'd have to convince me that this time is different. If you look in Asia, where they for whatever reason, are choosing not to have children, the Asian reproduction rate is in the order of 1.0 or lower. So they're rapidly disappearing. So the Asian countries are very, very quickly automating. The tools that I'm describing will allow the few humans that will be working very hard in 30 or 40 years if these trends continue. The rest of us will be dependent on those hardworking humans. It'll make their productivity more, much greater. Now, in this coming part, Eric Schmidt talks about how China is taking AI extremely seriously and why Washington is worried about the AI race with China. In China, <clears throat> the deep seek moment is equivalent to our chat GPT moment. I was there with Henry. Um, and this is what happens when you're talking to, to the Chinese about AI with Henry. And this means we are alive and we're listening to you. Thank you very much. Right. That's not what they're doing anymore. When, the, when DeepSeek showed up and our stock market lost a trillion dollars in one day, all of a sudden they began to understand the scale of what it was. So now there is a massive program in China to accelerate these things. I had thought, Illy and I and some of the other people in this room worked really hard on these um, chip controls. And the chip controls have been, um, in my view, largely effective. How did China get around them? Well, some of it was straightforward theft and evasion of the tariffs, but they also, they're sufficiently smart, they created new algorithms that used different kinds of computing to move forward. Because, they, because China operates in open source, that is, they, they release the software to everyone, there are two things that happen. We, we Americans immediately saw their idea and incorporated it in our own, so thank you very much, China, you invented something new, we immediately incorporated it. But second, because it's free, the proliferation issues around Chinese models have now become a very big deal. And our government is trying to figure out, uh, without success so far, how to handle this question. It's a very tricky question. But, but think about it. We're having this whole debate in our nation about what to do about Iran's nuclear program, and I'm not an expert in that. But these are the kind of conversations that happen here in, in DC. So when we get to the point where China is n months ahead, are we willing to bomb their data centers? My favorite example here is I was in a, I've been working on this. I was talking to somebody who said, the answer is obvious. I said, what? The good lady and the bad guy, we agree to a treaty where each of us puts dynamite on each other's 
uh, electricity supply. You get to blow up my electricity if you get mad, and I get to blow up your electricity if I get You get the idea. In this next part, Eric Schmidt actually talks about automatic drug discovery and finding cures for many different diseases with AI advancement. I'm the primary funder of a particular group that has built a model. It first learned how to do chemistry, and uh, it was trained as a foundation model for chemistry, and it's attached to a robotic lab. And what this model does is it generates hypothesis for drugs of one kind or another. And it just generates them. God knows if they're right. And then overnight, the robotic lab tests them and gives the report overnight. And then it starts again. And the reason I'm mentioning this is this is the future model of the fusion of AI and bio, right? The AI system generates all sorts of candidates to reduce the, um, essentially, the um, search space. If you think about it algorithmically, it's an exponential with too many degrees of exponential. So you have to come up with some way of reducing the space. So this particular group is using AI to reduce the space, run the things, and so forth. Their objective, we'll see if they pull it off, this is a research project, is to identify all human druggable tar targets within the next two years. If that occurs, then that information goes straight into the drug industry. Now, it's a different way of thinking. And it's profound in that it gives them the targets they need to go build drugs against. That's interesting to me. It's the com combination of AI and a robotic lab that does something in a wet lab, essentially. So one model that you should think about is wet labs will be roboticized. And the wet labs will have, arm they're essentially, they're not humanoid robots, they're arm robots. And they go boom, 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 and they, and they do the pipetting and so forth and so on. And they do it 24 hours a day. That's a major change in the way bio, bio, the biotech industry works. Do you think there's implications for ASI via drug discovery for like curing cancer and or personalized medicine? Just something very um, Yes, because under the, under the assumptions of superintelligence, these are systems that see things that we don't see. And so the assumption is that ASI, for example, could understand biological and cellular mechanisms that you are an expert in and I'm not at a level that humans will not. So that's why this is such a big deal. We've always assumed that humans would know, there would be at least one human, right, we'd call these people polymaths, they would understand these things. We're gonna end up in a world maybe 10 years from now where we won't actually understand why, but you as our scientist will say, I use it every day. When I, when I was at college, I was studying quantum physics and my friend who was a graduate student who was much better than I, and I said, is this stuff actually true? You know, it's like too weird to be true. And he said, yes, we use it every day. And I imagine in 10 years, some young student will come up to you and say, is this stuff true? And you'll say, frankly, I use it every day. No human understands it. What an interesting situation for you as a now a senior researcher 10 years from now to have to deal with. Now, Eric Schmidt is not the only guy saying all these things. Demi Hassabis recently in an interview literally said the exact same thing. Watch this. I think we are very close. I would say, um, you know, we're a couple of years away from having the first AI design, truly AI designed drugs um, for, major, for a major disease, cardiovascular, cancer. We're working on all of those things are isomorphic. And, um, and then obviously there's still the clinical trials and that stuff has to happen. And right now that would be the bottleneck. But I think certainly getting it into the clinic, the discovery phase, I would like to, you know, shrink that from years to months, maybe even weeks at some point. So I think in a couple of years, we, you know, I would be disappointed if we don't have some uh, great candidates for drugs for very important diseases, uh, you know, starting to go through clinical trials.